Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. This is Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. I'd argue the most influential people throughout history haven't been politicians. They haven't been billionaires or royalty. They've been scientists, artists, and explorers. J. Robert Oppenheimer is one of the most important, maybe the most important man who ever lived. He's the real life, modern Prometheus. I'm glad Christopher Nolan is making a movie about him because I don't think his period in history is very well covered, if discussed at all, in the average school. Nolan's movie, called Oppenheimer, is going to cover his life and focus on his work developing the atomic bomb during World War II. Oppenheimer was the man who led the largest and most advanced science project ever. In my opinion, even today, the Manhattan Project remains the most challenging undertaking in recorded human history, requiring deep understanding of just about every scientific discipline, from high energy physics to the chemistry of explosives, metallurgy, structural, electrical, and aerospace engineering. The man in charge of a project like this had to be a scientific renaissance man, a master of everything. When the military was looking for the person to lead the Manhattan Project and develop the bomb, Oppenheimer was not their first choice. The officials went through their list and began to realize all the usual choices were very impressive scientists, but like most, they were only knowledgeable within a narrow field. No one on the military's go-to list had the kind of intellect that could put it all together. Also, very few seemed to possess the kind of creativity required to build something impossible, something that required inventing hundreds of other technologies in order to build. After a while, they realized he was the only person who could do it, and in my opinion, they were probably right. Oppenheimer was as interesting a person as Albert Einstein, and just as important and influential. Just like the Earth revolves around the Sun, the world seems to revolve around characters. He was really the person who started the idea of big science. Like many historically significant people, during his life he was considered both a hero and a villain. It's been a while since I've been this excited about a movie coming out. Too bad we all have to wait until 2023. I remember waiting for Eyes Wide Shut and Blair Witch Project years ago. The cast for Oppenheimer looks pretty good, too. Robert Downey Jr. will be there, and Devil Wears Prada Emily Blunt came back from quietly fighting monsters in the woods to play Oppenheimer's wife, Catherine. The story of J. Robert Oppenheimer started when he was born in New York City in April of 1904 to Ella, who was a painter, and Julius Oppenheimer, a textile importer. Julius was born in Germany and came to the United States as a teenager in 1888 with nothing to his name, no money, and no degree. He also had almost no knowledge of the English language. He found a job at a textile company, and within a decade, Julius was an executive there. Eventually, the Oppenheimer family became very, very wealthy. The family had enough money to send J. Robert to prep school, where he showed generally good academic performance, except for arithmetic, which was apparently not his strong suit. Then he went to Harvard, where he graduated in chemistry in three years, but also took a lot of classes in philosophy, literature, and history. Oppenheimer, as a young man, started to develop as deep an appreciation of the arts as he had for the physical sciences. He started to have some trouble when he started graduate school at Cambridge. It seems the more eccentric and perhaps less charming parts of his personality were beginning to show themselves. Oppenheimer once confessed to an incident where he attempted to poison one of his classmates, but it's unclear if it ever actually happened. Oppenheimer started his PhD as an experimental scientist, but was apparently very clumsy and dangerous around chemicals, electricity, and equipment. He didn't seem to fit in the lab, but he showed a great deal of intellectual potential. He eventually followed in the direction of theoretical physics. Oppenheimer was a chain smoker for most of his life, 
a man of slight frame, but wild intensity, according to those who met him. He was known to go for days without eating, while he remained focused on reading and working. Some of the people who knew him described him as self-destructive, and he went through periods of serious depression. Oppenheimer also had a reputation for chasing after his colleagues' girlfriends. Some who knew him describe him as mesmerizing, calling him hypnotic in private interaction, but noting that he was often much less relaxed in more public settings. His associates usually fell into two camps, one that saw him as a bona fide genius, and the other that saw him as a pretentious poser. The younger students in the department almost always fell into the former category, idolizing him, some even adopting his characteristic speech and walk. Oppenheimer was awarded his PhD degree in March of 1927 at age 23. After the oral exam, James Frank, the professor administering, reportedly said, I'm glad that's over. He was at the point of questioning me. He became a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he made a few important early contributions to the new field of quantum mechanics. He and fellow physicist Max Born published a famous paper describing a novel math technique called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation for separating nuclear motion from electronic motion in molecules. Around this time, he married Catherine. Until the time leading up to the Second World War, politics and current events had been just about the only topic Oppenheimer wasn't interested in. He claimed that he didn't read a newspaper or listen to the radio. He only heard about the Wall Street crash of 1929 while he was on a walk with a friend six months after. Oppenheimer remarked that he never cast a vote until the 1936 presidential election. After his political awakening, he developed a viewpoint on the liberal side. He supported some left-wing social reforms and ideas that were later alleged to be communist during the McCarthy era. At the same time, the world was going crazy, and the U.S. government was looking for the right man to lead the most important military project in world history. Leading scientists from all across the United States and abroad were being called to service for the secret Manhattan Project. It's easy to understand why, despite his obvious talents and special skill for mathematically modeling atomic nuclei, J. Robert Oppenheimer, with his hippie attitude, might not be the military's first choice to lead their entire team and effectively run the burgeoning nuclear weapons program. Still, after a while, the government and military had no other choice. He was really the only man with enough depth in physics and breadth across the other technical disciplines to do the job. He was also one of the very few people who could actually lead other scientists, many of whom tend to be prima donnas. Basically, they needed a superstar to run that group of superstars. General Leslie Groves was brought in to supervise the Manhattan Project and Oppenheimer from the military side. These two men, with their very different personalities and worldviews, and rather sizable egos, clashed severely at first. However, after a while, even General Groves found something to respect in Oppenheimer's intellect and creative drive. In the upcoming movie, Groves is going to be played by Matt Damon to spar with Cillian Murphy as J. Robert Oppenheimer. The Manhattan Project was not easy. For an endeavor that was ultimately successful beyond imagination, it was an absolute nightmare. There was a lot of action and drama on the scene, so much that I can't begin to cover it all in this episode. If you're curious, check out my previous episode, Demon Core, to learn more about the craziness of the bomb's development leading up to the historic Trinity test in Nevada. After he had succeeded, and nuclear technology was a reality, Oppenheimer wasn't joyful. In fact, he became very upset and worried about where it was all headed, about the potential danger that scientific inventions could pose to humanity. In probably his most famous and telling quote, he describes how he felt after the first demonstration of the bomb. He said, We knew the world would not be the same. A few people laughed, a few people cried. Most people were silent. 
I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty, and to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that, one way or another. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.